When a lot of people hear about Taiwan, they believe that it is an independent country. Most of the world has diplomatic relations with both Beijing and Taipei as a one China. Many people wonder why that is the case. Both the Republic and People's Republic claim to be the legitimate China. That is why the world recognizes both governments under a one China policy. They do so in order to maintain solid and peaceful relations with both sides. Beijing sees Taiwan as a renegade province that must be integrated into the People's Republic of China by all means necessary, including by force, while Taipei sees the mainland as being led by an insurgent group that illegally came to power. Despite this, relations have improved between the island and the mainland, with even attempted negotiations about reunifying both sides. However, with political systems completely different, uh, they have always led to nothing. Both governments claim that China should follow different paths. The People's Republic of China claims that Maoism and Marxist-Leninist ideals are the best way forward, while the Republic of China sees a presidential democracy and Western values as the right path for China. If one wants to look at the legal aspect of which government is legitimate, the answer is quite simple. You've seen the title. Uh, Taiwan is actually the legitimate China. To explain why, we can easily look at the history. China is the oldest and still developing civilization, as they have a history dating back thousands of years. For most of this time, China was ruled by monarchs and presided over some of the most powerful dynasties in the world. But like all monarchies, they came to an end. The Qing dynasty reigned from the 17th century to 1912. That is when the last emperor, Pu Yi, abdicated at the age of four. This marked the end of over 2,000 years of imperial rule in China. Like all government collapses, a power vacuum engulfed China, and many warlords took power over certain regions of the nation. What kept the nation together was the new government that came into power. In December 1912, elections were held which saw the rise of the Kuomintang government and the founding of the Republic of China. Sun Yat-sen was the first president of a new Chinese republic. But this government was not the only one. The early years of the 20th century saw a rise of many Marxist-Leninist movements motivated by the success of the Bolsheviks during the Russian Civil War. With the help of the Soviet Union, the Chinese Communist Party was formed in 1921. In 1925, though, Sun died and the Kuomintang government was divided into left and right-wing movements. Many left-wing groups joined the Chinese Communist Party and a rivalry began between the two sides. But this next part is where we get to see the point of this title. In August 1927, the Chinese Civil War began as an insurgency. Members of the Chinese Communist Party started making attempts to overthrow the Kuomintang government, which was now led by Chiang Kai-shek. It began in a city that many of us have heard in the news recently. It began in Wuhan. Yeah, it appears that this city is a synonym for bad events starting. The Chinese Communist Party even organized a meeting where they stated that the goal of their party was to take power by force. In the early stages, the Chinese Communist Party suffered numerous defeats as they were merely an opposition group planning and executing insurgency operations. That changed quickly as China had a new enemy to face off against. In 1932, Japan invaded Manchuria with occasional skirmishes happening with the Chinese government. And then in 1937, when Japan actually invaded China, there was an attempted truce to try and create a united front against Japan, but this failed pretty quickly. Soon enough, the Chinese were fighting both each other and a foreign invader. The Chinese Communist Party mostly relied on guerrilla tactics and asymmetric warfare to fight the Japanese, while the Kuomintang government conventionally fought against the Japanese in an attempt to stop them. This didn't work out as, as well as an ill-prepared military was fighting against an enemy that was well-armed and well-trained.
But then the war ended in 1945 when Japan lost World War II. Between then and 1946, the leaders of both parties tried to negotiate an agreement while occasional clashes persisted. These failed and the war formally continued. This time was different as the Kuomintang government suffered numerous casualties during the Japanese invasion. Not only that, but they also lost a lot of public support. The Chinese Communist Party, on the other hand, had a completely different outcome. They had a military which numbered 1.6 million troops, as well as 2.3 million militiamen aiding them. Furthermore, they had support from the Soviet Union in both terms of logistics and weapons. And so, over the next three years, the Communist forces overtook government installations, and the Kuomintang government fled to Taiwan, which was a province of China until then. On October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China. He effectively won the war and took over the mainland. While the West rebuilt Japan, the government of the Republic of China set up a temporary capital in Taipei, which is still the capital of Taiwan. The Coming War on China is a documentary that was made in 2016 and hosted by John Pilger. He's basically a western guy that kisses Beijing's ass and portrays China as a legitimate and civilized country being bullied by the west. I just have to respond to this false claim he made in order to state my next argument. Even today it's difficult to understand the paranoia ignited by Mao's revolution. As we look at China on the map, we can see that China is the basic cause of all of our troubles in Asia. I believe that for the sake of our safety, it is necessary to be prepared for the possibility of a Chinese missile attack on the United States. One of the myths about Mao is that he was an implacable enemy of the capitalist West. <laughs> Shanghai today is a prosperous international city still run by the communists, at least in name. When I was last in China more than a generation ago, the loudest noise was the tinkling of bicycle bells. He is completely wrong here. That is because China under Mao Zedong resembled North Korea very much. It was a nation of indoctrinated and starving peasants in boiler suits and recited the words of their dear leader at every opportune moment. Because the Chinese Communist Party took power by overthrowing an internationally recognized government, the People's Republic of China was shunned by most of the world. China lost all of the geopolitical influence it once had, resulting in great isolation much like North Korea. And its leader with these utopia-like communist values decided to further isolate that country even more. Taiwan still retained its seat at the UN Security Council and also voted in favor of going to war against communists in Korea between 1950 and 1953. The developed world saw it as the legitimate and sole China, but things changed in the 1970s. In 1976, Mao Zedong died and the following leader, Deng Xiaoping, saw what his country had become and wanted to change that image. He started developing friendly relations with other nations and uh, started opening up the country. The 1970s is also the moment when the Cold War was in full swing, and in order for the US to gain a leverage against the Soviets, in 1979 the US ultimately recognized the People's Republic of China, and a new policy began called the One China Policy, where the West would maintain relations with both the People's Republic and the Republic of China. Taiwan even agreed to this as it was subject to the Taiwan Act, which states that the U.S. would bolster Taiwan's defenses against China, which continued to threaten to retake the island. Many wonder how the People's Republic of China accomplished this. Well, Deng Xiaoping offered a certain resource it had always had. 
It's a very large population that could act as cheap, low-skilled labor. From the 1980s onward, China accepted foreign investment along with employing its people with the goal of producing cheap products. It essentially became the world's factory all the way up to the point where it is now the second largest economy in the world. However, good relations didn't last. Reaction to the Tiananmen Square massacre, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, the third Taiwan Strait crisis, and the Hainan Island incident all saw a deterioration of relations with the People's Republic of China. It is one of the initial stages of the West's rivalry with that nation. It's definitely a country that seeks to overtake us and try to infiltrate every part of our society. What's better is that there is a solution. I made a video on how to take down China's influence and I left a link in the description. The only thing keeping the People's Republic of China afloat is our investments. And if we were to take that away, it would become the isolationist country it was under Mao Zedong. It is that isolationist state that it should be in as the true authority over all of China belongs to Taiwan. In other words, the democratically elected Republic of China.